Uh, move on to today's lecture, which is um, phagocytosis, endocytosis, um, and post Golgi transport. Um, and to really get the most out of this lecture, I want to make sure that everybody was comfortable with the last lecture, the formation of the clathrin coat, coated vesicles, the formation of the COP2 vesicles and how they occur, um, and just also the transport signals that go between them, okay? Um, and if you aren't familiar with this, as, you're, as I'm sitting here talking, uh, go back and look at it first, okay? Um, one other thing I need to mention too, which came up, um, there's a limit on how in, the size of files I can hold on Sakai, so I'm going to have to be deleting um, some of the video lectures as I upload new ones. Um, so make sure if you want to have a copy um, that you're downloading them and saving them, okay? Just, just be aware of that. Okay, so today's lecture, so once a secretory protein has sort of entered the ER, it gets folded and we looked at how that happens, and it gets packaged into a uh, COP2 vesicle um, and is transported to the Golgi, okay? Um, and when the COP2 vesicles butt off from the ER, they actually undergo homotypic fusion and form vesicular tubular clusters, or sometimes called the ergic. Um, and then in the event that something has leaked out or something needs to be recycled um, back to the endoplasmic reticulum from the Golgi, it gets packaged um, into a COP2 vesicle. And this re recycles proteins from the Golgi to the ER. And COP1 vesicles are also, um, uh, they also mediate inter-Golgi transport, right? And that can happen either by, you know, COP1 vesicles butting off um, in sort of both directions or through cisternal maturation. We looked at that. Um, and so, but once a protein has gotten to the Golgi, other sorting processes take over. Um, and today we're also going to look at endocytosis and secretion um, and what happens sort of in the later stages of the secretory pathway. Um, and it can get pretty complicated because it's, it's sort of a very fuzzy sort of process, right? It, it's it's not very defined, okay? Um, but what you need to know is that the endosome and the lysosome are, are key players in all of this. So today we're going to basically look pretty much um, at transport to from the Golgi to the late endosome to the lysosome, and then we're actually going to look um, in the other first half how things go from the cell exterior um, to the late endosome and then to the lysosome and, and some other recycling that occurs here, as well as um, phagocytosis, okay? Um, so, but first we're going to cover Golgi to the lysosome, okay? So, first off, here's the lysosome. Um, it's a compartment that's filled with um, hydrolytic enzymes, right? You can almost think of it as the stomach of the cell. It's what breaks everything down when the cell comes in. And it's filled with these things called acid hydrolases. There's nucleases, proteases, um, uh, lipases, phosphatases, a whole bunch of um, glucosidases, it, you name it. And they're only active at a low pH, and that's really important because, they're, once again, they're all pretty much made um, at the endoplasmic reticulum. And you don't want them active as they're being transported. You only want them to be active when they get to the lysosome. And the way the cell does that is they, they're on, they only function at low pH. And the lysosome actually has a proton pump, an ATP-driven proton pump called the vacuolar ATPase <clears throat> that basically uses the conversion, the energy stored in ATP, um, and hydrolyzes ATP to ADP, and that pumps protons in, which lowers the pH. And then they all became become um, active. And these are the the lysosome is basically used uh, for all, a lot of the recycling that's happening in the cell. Okay, and also breaking down a lot of the foodstuffs that are brought into the cell. Um, here's just an EM of some lysosomes. Uh, you can actually see them by staining for acid phosphatase. So acid, it's just a phosphatase that's um, present in there and it functions at low pH. Um, now, <coughs> the lysosome undergoes 
uh, sort of maturation not too dissimilar from cisternal maturation. Um, and they can sometimes be very heterogeneous and difficult to detect. Okay, so what ends up happening is the lysosome will fuse with like the late endosome to form what is called um, an endolysosome. And so if, let's say this blue little Pac-Man character over here was acid phosphatase, for example. If you stain this in the cell like we saw um, here, uh, what you end up getting is sort of a mixture where, you know, you're staining the late endosome that is already fused with a lysosome and the endolysosome as well as the lysosome. So it's very heterogeneous. Um, and that's what I sort of meant at the introductory slide here when I said, you know, the sort of the later stages of the secretory pathway can get sort of messy because um, you oftentimes have lysosomal compartments in endosomes after they fused and then there's sort of the endolysosome and it's very hard to tell the difference between what an endolysosome and a late endosome is um, as well as just the lysosome. But ultimately these acid phosphatases will sort of sort of as the pH drops as it's going from late endosome to lysosome, the um, acid hydrolases here will actually cleave up the compartments that are there, okay? Um, uh, so similar to the lysosome, uh, plants and yeast actually have this thing called a vacuole, um, and here it is, and you can see the cytosol and the, and the chloroplast, and this is just a plant cell. Um, and these just function similar to the lysosome, except in the case with the plants and stuff like that, they can actually store food stuffs and things like that. Um, so the size of the vacuole will oftentimes dictate the, the size of the cells. Um, so here you have small vacuoles, and as they store um, more and more stuff in them, the, the cell will actually get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there's also a process called autophagy. Um, and so this is pretty neat because let's say you have a sort of a mitochondria. And, and the functional lifespan of a mitochondria in a liver cell is about 10 days. Okay, and so the cell wants to recycle all of that or as much of it as it can. And plus, if you have a bad um, mitochondria around, it can actually cause a lot of cellular damage um, because it's producing a lot of reactive oxygen species which are toxic to the cell. And so what ends up happening, let's say you have an organelle in the cell you want to get rid of. Um, you have uh, basically the, a nucleation event um, where you start to form this double membrane um, organelle here called the autophagosome, okay? And that is basically engulfing, let's say, a mitochondria or something like that. And then it'll fuse with the autophagosome, or the lysosome and the autophag autophagosome will fuse, and then the, uh, uh, the vacuole or ATPase will start to lower the pH in, in the thing, and then all of a sudden the acid hydrolases and whatnot become quite active and will chew everything up and then these can just be recycled, okay? Um, so the autophagosome is actually a, a very tightly regulated process because you don't necessarily want to be destroying things in a cell that are good. Um, you only want to get rid of the bad stuff that's there, okay? Um, so you guys should probably know this. This is uh, actually a, a, an area of real interest now, especially in um, cancer biology, okay? Um, so there's many pathways to the lysosome, okay? You can have um, autophagy, which will produce an autophagosome, and then that will fuse with the lysosome. You can have endocytosis, where you're um, taking up stuff from the exterior of the cell, and then it'll become an early endosome, and then a late endosome, and eventually that will become an endolysosome, and then as the vacuole or ATPase starts to function and lower the pH, it just becomes the lysosome, uh, where all of the acid hydrolases are sort of cleaving up everything. Um, and also bacteria that are destined um, to be destroyed by like a macrophage, they will um, undergo phagocytosis, uh, and then you'll have a phagosome, in this in case it has a bacterium in it, and then that will fuse with the lysosome and all of the acid hydrolases will, will attack the bacterium. Um, 
An interesting little tidbit about this, there are certain bacterias um, such as Salmonella typhimurium and Salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever. Uh, and one of the things that they do is they get into this phagosome right here and they block the Rab protein that allows fusion um, with the lysosome. So all of a sudden they're producing things that block the Rab protein that's needed for tethering and fusion with the lysosome. And what ends up happening is the bacterium just sits here and it diverts things from like the late endosome and early endosome and it brings in all of these foodstuffs and it can replicate, divide, and it'll eventually rupture and lyse the macrophage. And so that's one of the reasons typhoid fever is, is such a horrible um, disease. Um, and you guys can go back and look at um, sort of the rabs and the fusion and, and think about that because I threw the listeria question on your last exam. That was actually in your textbook, um, version six of your textbook with, with, act, uh, with ACT A. And so I could throw a question like that on your next things. Well, what would happen if you, you know, in, somehow inhibited the rab proteins of uh, bacteria? Just a sort of a thought off the top of my head there. But that's how I want you guys to start thinking about these mechanisms. What would happen if, if you blocked a certain step, okay? Um, so here's just a, a nice EM of uh, autophagosome where you actually have a mitochondria and a peroxisome um, in this sort of double membrane here. Um, and then that will uh, actually fuse with the lysosome and then eventually this will get uh, sort of all chewed up and, and what's there that's good will get recycled, right? Like all the amino acids and things like that and, and some of the lipids and what uh, and whatnot. So, um, okay, so now we're gonna cover transport to the lysosome and, and how do various lysosomal hydrolases actually get trafficked to the lysosome. And so if you guys remember, I, I sort of said early on you don't really need to know any of the transport signals besides for the KDEL sequence, um, which is retrieval from the endoplasmic reticulum. But in the case with transport to the lysosome, I want you to know this pathway as well. Um, and it involves mannose 6-phosphate. Okay, so proteins with the mannose 6-phosphate here, this is a glycosylation mark, um, and you don't have to memorize the structure of it, just know that it's mannose 6-phosphate. Um, actually, transports uh, proteins from the Golgi to the lysosome, okay? Um, and we'll see how that happens in a second. But here's just your lysosomal hydrolase, um, and here is the mannose 6-phosphate, okay? You got your mannose here, this is the 6-carbon, and you have a phosphate on the, on the end of it. Um, okay, so once the mannose 6-phosphate is, uh, or the lysosomal hydrolase precursor with um, the glycosylation mannose on it comes from the ER. Um, it actually gets converted to mannose 6-phosphate, and then the mannose 6-phosphate is bound by the mannose 6-phosphate receptor, and that gets packaged into a clathrin coat. It buds off, and then when the fuses with the sort of early endosome and uh, sort of the pH starts to drop with the vacuolar ET. ATPase, the pH causes dissociation, the phosphate gets removed, and then you have your lysosomal hydrolase precursor, and then when that eventually sort of maturates into the lysosome due to the pH drop and things, um, it, you know, it just becomes the lysosome. And meanwhile, the mannose 6-phosphate actually gets packaged and retrieved by retromer, that vesicle we saw last time, which I said you didn't really have to pay much attention to. But here's where the, the retromer coat, it, it, it brings back the mannose 6-phosphate to the trans-Golgi network so it can grab some more um, mannose 6-phosphate um, uh, acid hydrolases or acid hydrolases that contain the mannose 6-phosphate. Okay, so just sort of know this, this cycling pathway that occurs here. Um, here's also how it happens in a little bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> you have your lysosomal hydrolase with the mannose on it, and then you take UD, uh, UDP glucnac, um, and that actually gets added using the glucnac phosphotransferase, uh, which then uh, adds the glucnac phosphate and mannose, um, and then it gets uh, basically 
recognized uh, and cleaved, and then it becomes, the gluconac gets removed, and then it can bind to the mannose-6-phosphate receptor. Okay, pretty straightforward. You don't really need to know all of the details in this, but I do want you to appreciate the cycling and the transport of the mannose-6-phosphate um, and how that works. Okay, and just remember, this goes back to everything we covered in the last lecture where we were looking at the clathrin coated assembly um, as well as then um, the fusion where you had the V snares and the T snares and the RABs and stuff like that. So really when you start to look at these images, think big picture here, think mechanism, think how does this happen and what would happen if you could block these things. Um, and this raises an even bigger point because in certain instances you may want to either block a certain pathway in this, um, you know, if, if there was a disease or something like that. You want to start, as you guys advance in your sort of careers, you want to be able to really understand this. So if you're faced with a question, well, how would I block this, right? And what are the mechanisms involved? And that's why, you know, I really want you guys to sort of appreciate all of the mechanisms that are here. Um, okay, so um, we just sort of covered uh, Golgi to the late endosome to the lysosome. Now we're going to sort of look at the cell exterior to the early endosome um, to the late endosome and then eventually to the lysosome. Um, and there's two main pathways from the cell exterior uh, to the lysosome. Um, and one is phagocytosis, right? Um, and that's where you're bringing in large um, particles. And then there's this smaller vesicles, penocytosis. So sometimes people refer to phagocytosis as cellular eating and penocytosis as cellular drinking. Um, I don't necessarily, uh, I can't comment on that, so. Um, okay, so here's just a great EM of uh, sort of a, a macrophage, uh, sort of phagocytosing um, two bacterium. Um, and you can see the, the membrane sort of uh, invaginating around it, uh, the, the, the bacteria. Um, and these macrophages also neutrophils did it, and we saw the, neutro the neutrophil chasing the bacteria in, when we were covering lamellipodia. Um, and so the macrophages and neutrophils are actually, they develop from hematopoietic stem cells and, uh, right out of the bone marrow. So all of our blood comes out of our bone marrow um, in this process called hematopoiesis. And we'll cover that sort of, I think it's in the last lecture um, of the class where we're looking at sort of stem cell development. Um, but it's a, a cool process. Um, so here's just a nice cross-section of phagocytosis. Here's actually a dividing bacterium. Uh, and what you get is this sort of um, pseudopod formation that sort of goes around and engulfs it. And you can sort of see the, the pseudopod uh, forming right here where it sort of engulfs it. Um, and as you can imagine, the pseudopods uh, require actin and also uh, changes in the sort of membrane um, composition. Okay, so here you have the, the actin sort of going and wrapping around, um, and this is all sort of catalyzed by Rho um, activation, and you get also conversion of PI45P2 to PI345P3. Um, Okay, and the actin eventually will come and it'll fuse together, and that's mediated by PI3 kinase. So, in other words, the um, conversion of the phosphoinositides can actually drive this sort of pseudopod formation in phagocytosis, um, and the actin, the changes in actin are sort of regulated by Rho. Um, so, penocytosis, these are actually clathrin coated vesicles, and here they are just sort of taking up some things. Uh, you can sort of see this nice little time lapse um, microscopy where you have the vesicle start to invaginate. It's invaginated more, it pinches off, um, and here's the, uh, the penocytosis. Here's a little cool fact 3% of the, the plasma membrane is ingested every minute. So, just Take that in for a second and think about how dynamic this whole process is, right? The whole pulse, pulse Golgi, Golgi transport, as well as just secretory pathway in general, how dynamic it all is. Um, you also have these cavioli, um, and they form 
uh, on the plasma membrane as well, um, and these are uh, basically formed by caveolins, and they tend to take up lipid rafts, okay? And so occasionally you have this thing, and we'll cover it in a second, receptor-mediated endocytosis, where you want to take receptors off of a cell. You can just sort of package them into these vesicles, and then they can either be recycled and transported to the lysosome, or they can go back to the plasma membrane if needed. Um, okay, so for re receptor-mediated endocytosis, we're actually going to cover the low-density lipoprotein, okay? And this is pretty important, um, and it's just a well-characterized thing. So anybody with um, high cholesterol uh, um, actually has a lot of this uh, low-density lipo lipoprotein floating around in their bloodstream because they have a defect in their cell's, cell's ability to take up LDL. Okay, <clears throat> um, and one of the reasons we're going to cover the um, LDL receptor uh, and receptor-mediated endocytosis, it's actually one of the best understood just because high cholesterol is, is such a problem, okay? Um, and so just in general, the, the LDL, the low-density lipoprotein, actually contains about 1,500 cholesterol molecules in it, okay? Um, and so the way it works uh, is you have the LDL receptor on the plasma membrane of a cell, and then um, the low-density lipoprotein sort of floating around in the bloodstream, for example, will bind to the low-density lipoprotein, and then the, uh, you have the adapter protein binding site, and then it will capture it and start to form it and capture it in to a clathrin coated pit, which will become a clathrin coated vesicles. Um, and then that'll go off to the endosome, as we'll see in a second. Um, and so one of the things that happens, and this is very, very common, and I'm actually one of them because um, I have high cholesterol, I probably have a mutation in my LDL receptor, okay, which sort of blocks the ability of this protein to interact with the adapter proteins in the clathrin coated vesicle. And so these never get taken up. Um, and so you have, uh, you tend to have high cholesterol. Now, um, interestingly, if you have high cholesterol, you take this drug called um, statins, uh, Lipitor is one of them, um, and what it does is it doesn't affect anything here, but it will actually affect the uh, sort of cholesterol formation by inhibiting uh, the HMG-CoA reductase, which we covered early on in the beginning of the year. Um, so I'm just sort of trying to bring you back to where this is and, and why it's important. Okay, so in general, LDL binds to the LDL receptor, which is then bound to the adapter proteins and packaged into a clathrin-coated pit. Okay. Um, and then this will ultimately form a clathrin coated vesicle. Um, and so in the recycling and receptor-mediated um, endocytosis, a couple of things can happen here, right? You can, endo, you, you can form an endocytic vesicle, which will then fuse with the early endosome, and then depending on what's there, it can actually get recycled back to the plasma membrane, um, or it can be sort of jutted off to the lysosome to be recycled, or it can undergo this process called transcytosis, where, um, where uh, it will go from the endosome to a transport vesicle and then to the uh, other side of a cell. Um, what's interesting here is actually transcytosis is oftentimes how antibodies get past um, uh, epithelial um, layers, right? They, there's an FC receptor which will bind to the FC region of the antibody and it'll undergo endocytosis um, and then get transported across the cell, okay? Um, but ultimately there's many paths once uh, a vesicle, uh, once an endocytic vesicle is formed um, and there's all kinds of sorting that can happen here depending on what it is. Um, and so here's sort of a perfect example of that. So you getting back to the LDL receptor and LDL it binds, it, get pa it gets packaged into a clathrin coated vesicle, the vesicle uncoats, and then using sort of the rabs and the snares and the rab effectors and all of that stuff, it'll fuse with the early endosome. Um, slight pH change will uh, sort of dissociate 
the LDL from the LDL receptor, and the LDL receptor um, can actually get recycled back to the plasma membrane, um, while the LDL gets sort of shunted off to the lysosome, where free, free cholesterol um, is released and, and also some of the amino acids that were part of the low-density lipoprotein get degraded and recycled. Okay. Um, here's just sort of the um, a nice staining of it. So you have your recycling endosomes, your late endosomes, your early endosomes, and how they all sort of match. Um, and just as general rule, the many receptors are sort of undergoing this, um, but like the transferrin receptor is constantly being taken up and then uh, uh, moved back to the plasma membrane. Um, and other <coughs> receptors like the opiate receptor and the EGF receptor, they're actually down-regulated by endocytosis um, and oftentimes directed to the lysosome to be uh, um, uh, sort of degraded. Okay. Um, um, so that's it for this. Uh, I'll get the second half uh, done in a second, um, and we'll pick up from there. Okay.